So, as Sasha said, uh, this is the last news replacement. So, the, the topic initially uh, from Siamak Tati was supposed to be about probabilistic cellular automata. So, I removed the part I don't understand. So, it will be just about cellular automata. Okay, so first, uh, gentle introduction with an historical uh, background. So, cellular automata have been introduced in the 40s. It was introduced, uh, some people would say by Ulam, some people by, by, would say by von Neumann. I don't know, I'm not a specialist of history of, of mathematics, but uh, what is sure is that uh, von Neumann was working on, on this notion of uh, mechanical self-replication. And the idea that uh, replication or reproduction uh, is not something uh, typical of biological life, but that you could do it also with some mechanical object. And so uh, he designed some idea of some uh, machines that would be able to produce replicas of themselves using uh, some, some parts in some shelves and just building this. And, and why did it emerge in the 40s? It's, it's just, bef just after Watson's Creek uh, um, discovery on DNA. And really the idea of Feynman is to have some kind of a machine where there is some information inside. And I think Sasha uh, made already an introduction about uh, algorithmic information. So some information that would describe an object but be still small enough that it could fit inside the object itself and be used as a description of the object. So uh, first von Neumann was thinking about building the machine, uh, a real machine, and Ulam convinced him to have some kind of uh, mathematical object that would do the same and it would be more practical to design. Thus, so, cellular automaton. So certainly most of you heard already about cellular automata and the game of life, I, I would guess. I will still talk about it. I mean, I think it's mandatory to talk about game of life in tutorials about cellular automata, but uh, what is a cellular automaton? So it's a discrete dynamical system if you are more of a mathematician or it's some kind of automaton if you are more of a computer scientist. You have some space, usually in the Classical settings, the, the space is a grid. It's a d-dimensional grid, and you have cells. And uh, really what you do is that you paint the space with states. You put states from a finite set in every cell. So sometimes people prefer to put letters from an alphabet as states. I do prefer to put colors. So if you are colorblind, I'm sorry, part of the talk would be strange to follow. Uh, and um, you have some time, some clock. And at each tick of the clock, in a deterministic, synchronous, uniform way, every cell looks at the local neighborhood and updates its state. And so the most famous uh, CA uh, is the Game of Life by Conway. It was designed in the 70s, start 1970. And um, you have a grid which is really a plane of, um, of white and black cells. Some cells are alive, some cells are dead. And you have some local rules that try to imitate what happens in real life. So you know that in real life, when you have uh, three alive uh, cells together, they give birth to a new cell. <laughs> and um, when you are alive, um, you can survive, but sometimes you can also uh, die. You can die because you are lonely, isolated when you have less than three alive cells around you. And you can also uh, die because uh, it's a bit overcrowded around you. So if you have more than four cells around you, you, you would die. Also right, you keep your state. So then there is the mandatory animation. So this is what happens if you start from some random um, partial grid of, of cells and you just iterate the rule. Okay, let me... So this was my random initial configuration. So Sasha will ask me what is randomness, and we don't have time for that. So it's a pseudo-random uh, configuration generated with about half probability of being alive or dead. And then uh, if you apply the rule, some things start to emerge. You see like blinkers up there. 
And uh, I'm not a specialist of the game of life, but if you want to know really a lot of more things about that and some nice theorem, you should try to find Ville Salo, he is just there, and he has some nice theorems about that. So uh, he is the specialist. So this was from a, a random configuration, but as you know, people like to engineer stuff. So there are also some constructions which are human uh, constructed, like uh, that well-known uh, uh, Gosper gun, which is that construction on the northwest of the configuration. And it generates with a, a period of, I believe it's 46 uh, time steps, some, um, uh, I would say, some signal consisting of gliders that advance, here it is, to the southeast of the configuration. Okay, so von Neumann. You know that von Neumann constructed some very complicated machines and in several automata it's also the case. So if you want to read about that particular self-replicating automaton he built, uh, there is a posthum uh, book of a few hundred pages that describes the rule and the construction. Uh, nobody has seen the complete machine working because it would require a very huge amount of time just to make one iteration but at least conceptually it's very clear that it works. It has uh, as many as 29 states, and uh, the states are completely described on the left of the diagram, and I believe you can't read it. But the idea is very simple is, and very nice. So the idea of Van Neumann is to have some kind of DNA. The DNA is that little strip on the bottom side which is containing the wool information for the machine. How do you obtain it? Sasha would say you just take a fixed point, and that's the idea. Yes effectively, and then you have two parts in the machine. There is a universal constructor, which is a finite part of the configuration with some kind of an arm that you can move, and the arm can be put anywhere and can modify the configuration. A kind of, uh, yeah, some engine, universal engine that uh, is able to construct anything, and uh, it receives instruction from a universal computer. So this would be from uh, I believe uh, Sylvain Stoke about Turing machines and uh, the fact that uh, there is a universal notion of computation. So you bind them together, then you take a description of the universal computer for the constructor. You take a description of the universal constructor, you put them together, write them on the tape and cut them. And then you have a machine that would, uh, after some time, replicate itself. Okay, and certainly we are convinced that this is a good example of a self-replicating machine. But it's quite complicated and in, in the 60s it was uh, still not possible to simulate it. So I believe today with uh, big computers and a lot of money and a lot of energy we could see it. But people have tried to do better, so after that uh, there is uh, an automaton by uh, code with um, some more biological model that you can look at here. You have um, some kind of wires, sh sheeted wires, the blue ones with the, the red uh, protection around it, and uh, on those wires you have some kind of signals. So let me rewind the, the tape. So you have those signals. The signals are, are constituted of two cells. The idea is that it's pointing in the direction it's moving. So you still have local rules. The rules are uh, based on a uh, uh, von Neumann neighborhood that is the cell and its four neighbors to the east, north, south, and west. And uh, the, the signals are moving inside the wire. And when you are, uh, arrive at the end of the wire, depending on the color of the signal, you take different actions like uh, removing the red protection, extending the wire by one cell, turning to the left, and stuff like that. And with that kind of um, information, it's uh, enough to construct self-replicating machine. And indeed, even if code construction itself, as you can see on the bottom of my slide, takes several million cells and, uh, okay, quite a bit of uh, time also to make uh, one step of replication. Sometimes after, uh, Langton came with a very simple implementation of self-reproduction, removing the universal computation part of it and taking just a finite loop. It is this, a simplified automaton uh, based on the one by code, and the idea is the following. Your signal is still moving inside the wires. When you enter uh, 
some of these uh, bifurcations, you duplicate the signal. And uh, if you have a finite loop like that, you just need to describe one side of, of your loop and do it four times, and it will provide you with a, a whole uh, square, of course. Then you need some magic to happen when the square is finished, like there, and uh, you can start again. And now you have a self-reproducing machine with only 86 steps, and uh, you just need 151 steps to do a full reproduction step, as you have seen during my blah blah. Okay, so why do I show you this? It's because of the next slide. I've talked about self-reproduction, but what is the definition of a self-reproducing machine? Because I've seen positive examples, but you people here like theorems, so you like to prove that <laughs> things, objects are, don't have a property, so you need a definition. So for example, does this look like uh, self-reproduction for you? This is uh, the XOR rule, so you have two states and you just do the sum modulo two of your four neighbors and yourself, and effectively, starting by with some pattern, after some time you see copies of the pattern, but it's just because of you know, uh, the way they do behave, so. That's uh, not very satisfying to say that this is able of self-reproduction, so you need a formal definition to deal with that. And that's exactly the kind of problem we will have when we will talk about universality. So, the outline of my talk would be in three parts. Every part will talk about computation from a different point of view. So first we will discuss how do you compute inside cellular space, how do you do uh, nice uh, universal constructions with uh, things like game of life or rule 110 and stuff like that. And what is a, a good definition for universality. After playing with that, uh, in part two we will try to study properties of cellular automata seen as uh, dynamical systems like, I don't know, injectivity of the rule, bijectivity, reversibility, stuff like that. And then we will move to the uh, interesting part, which is part three, where we will discuss how part one, combined with part two, provide a way to prove undecidability result on, on these objects. No questions so far? Please don't hesitate to ask questions. And uh, so you should find the, the slides from this uh, lecture on the website for the conference or following this link. And if you want to play with cellular automata, I would recommend to play with this Golly simulator, which is a very nice uh, cellular automata uh, simulator stuff. And um, you have also this handbook if you want to know more. And there is a reference to a whole tutorial on the on the, the web page also. And uh, this tutorial, is, this uh, survey that I'm pointing at is by Yarko Kari, and most people here know that in two weeks we will have a special uh, event for the 16th birthday of uh, Yarko Kari. He is usually the specialist giving the tutorial on Serial Automata. Okay, so let's go to computation into inside cellular space. First we will go through definition, then we will give uh, universal computation from the second shell point of view inside the cellular space, and then I will say a few words about intrinsically uh, massively parallel computation in this world. So let's see, what would be a good definition of a cellular automaton, or a classical definition at least, because I know some people here have a different definition. Some endomorphism of, I don't know. So, <laughs> what's a cellular automaton? Uh, to give a cellular automaton, you need to decide the space on which you work. So, I, as I'm talking about classical cellular automata, I will just give the dimension of my ZD grid. You need a finite set of states, I will call it S. You need some way to describe the locality of the rule, so that would be the neighborhood, it's called N here, it's just a finite uh, subset of the grid you're considering. And you have your local update rule that describe how your cell will change according to what it sees in its neighborhood. So that's the syntactic static object. 
Then what we play on are configuration. So a configuration, as I say, is just a painting of, uh, of the grid with the state. So it's a coloring of ZD by your state set S. So it might look like that if you're in dimension one, right, with three states. And then your dynamics is given by the global map. The global map is just the application of the local rule in every point of the configuration in a uniform way. So if you call it G, then for every configuration, if you look at point Z, then uh, you should see the image by F of the local part of the configuration around Z. And uh, if you look at cellular automata in one dimension, it's not very intuitive to look at just one strip of colors which that is blinking in front of you, right? So we prefer to consider space-time diagrams. So we will peel up the configuration in time, and we will construct the, that object with one more half dimension, which is the space-time diagram. In the space-time diagram, the next line is constructed by applying the global rule uh, on the previous uh, line. So. Maybe a picture would be better for that. Here it is. Um, of course, time always goes up in space-time diagrams. <laughs> Those who know. Uh, so, <laughs> so this is a partial view of a space-time diagram, because my configuration has been infinite, right? But uh, this is a, a rectangular window uh, on the space-time diagram. Um, I chose a rule at random looked at it until I, I saw something convincing. If you like that idea of, uh, of looking at uh, rules at random and selecting the one you, you believe has uh, good behavior, you should read the work of uh, Stefan Wolfram, but uh, I will not talk about it today. So um, this number seems quite interesting, and indeed it produced uh, some nice space-time diagrams. So you have three states. Zero is white, one is gray, two is black, I believe, here. The, the automaton is looking just at the left and right neighbors, plus its, uh, itself when it ablates the, the cell. And the rule is given by this nice formula. And uh, what you see if you start from a almost random configuration in the bottom is that there are some kind of structures here which are interacting. Some kind of, let's say, particles uh, having collisions and so on. And uh, it's just a sequence of partial view of configuration. And that's the kind of object we are interested in uh, in this tutorial. OK. A bit of vocabulary. So we need to talk about neighborhoods. So I will only talk about dimension one and dimension two during this talk. Of course, most of the things apply to all dimensions. Some results uh, are different depending on the dimension. I will try to point it out when uh, it's the case. But in dimension two, there are two, two classical neighborhoods. Either you consider the first neighbors uh, in the style of von Neumann, so you just have uh, north, south, east, and west. Or you consider it in the style of Moore. Of course, there are some way to simulate each neighborhood with the other, but that's not the point. That's the two neighborhoods we will use in the talk. And in dimension one, I will consider either first neighbors on both sides, or I will consider uh, one-way cellular automata that just look on in one direction. And I still need one definition. I need to decide what are the interesting configurations to consider, because when you look at the whole space of configuration, uh, there are a bit too many of them, right? So uh, as a computer scientist, I prefer to have uh, countable objects most of the time. So what could we take there? So if you went to Sylvain's lecture, maybe you would like to take every configuration that can be computed by a program, right? Every recursive configuration. That would be a nice idea at first until you learn about uh, Rice theorem that say, states that everything is undecidable about that kind of object. So it's not a good idea. So you could turn to final configuration. You just uh, do so that you have one state which is quiescent 
What does it mean? It just means that when you just see that state, you stay in that state. It's the white state from the game of life. The all white configuration stays all white. So then you put a finite pattern in the middle. What is nice is that the finite pattern, as we have local rule, it will have a, a finite pattern as an image, so it's a stable set of configurations. You could also be tempted to take periodic configuration because I believe that if you try to program a simulator for solar automata, maybe you will have a finite array of cells, and when you will be on the borders trying to decide what to do to update the whole, it would be easier to take your position modulo the size. Uh, that's nice, but periodic configurations have, are somehow finite, and cellular automata are local, so they keep all the symmetries. So if you have period P, then your image has a period that divides P. So the orbits will all be finite, and it will not be very funny. You can also mix both, so you take periodic configuration, and you put a finite pattern in the middle, that's a ultimately periodic configuration, and that's way better. So that's what you should think about when you, you think about uh, several automata dynamics and simulations. Ultimately periodic configuration is, is the right uh, way to consider them. And of course, all my drawings will be finite, so you can also consider some uh, partial diagrams, or you can also consider uh, some uh, triangles of computations. If you just have a finite part of a configuration, you can still apply your local rule on this, and it will give you some kind of a triangle of computation, a partial triangle. OK, no more definitions, general definitions. Yes? So ultimately periodic means, this. Ultimately periodic means um OK. Ultimately periodic means that it g becomes periodic after a certain finite number of steps. Uh, OK. So in dimension one, it's simpler to, we can say it like that. Because uh, the subtleties is, do you want the same period on both sides, right? In, in one dimension, you can have a left periodic word and a right periodic word that are different. In dimension two, it's more difficult to imagine because, of course, they would connect. So uh, either a finite pattern in the periodic configuration or in dimension one, a periodic word on both sides. Yes. OK. Some kind of u omega v. Something like that. OK. So let me talk a bit about universality. Uh, I don't remember, actually, in Sylvain's introduction about Turing machine, if he mentioned the universal machine. Did he? No? Ah. <coughs> so sp spoiler, uh, among uh, Turing machines, um, there is one that you construct usually when you do the theory of computation. You construct a machine, which you call a universal machine, that is able to perform every computation given an encoding of a machine and an encoding of an input. But in that case, universal is not a precisely defined notion. It's the name of one machine. So let's try to find this in... Uh, cellular space. So uh, as I said, even in von Neumann's first uh, automaton, there is some kind of universally capable uh, um, Turing complete stuff, a universal uh, computation device, which is here to provide a convenient way to actually construct the fixed points we are talking about. And um, in a lot of old construction in cellular automata, you use universal device to provide a way to embed computation inside the cellular grid. So the classical ones uh, would be von Neumann. Uh, OK, in this table, I, the, the two last columns are the size of the neighborhood. It's usually von Neumann or Moore. And the last column is the number of states of the automaton. So um, of course, von Neumann and code that I described are already universal. The game of life is also capable of universal computation. Maybe you know about that. Maybe you don't. I will explain just after how you can implement it. 
And uh, there is um, also a nice example with uh, Fundamental Neighborhood by uh, banks with uh, two states and uh, which is able of universal computation. So how would you compute in a cellular space? Um, the simplest way to do it is to mimic what you do with circuits when you do electronics, because people already have thought about it. So you would have some kind of signal, some wires that would transport signals to the place you want. You need ways to move those signals around, to make them turn in space, to have some kind of fan out to duplicate the information, because we are not doing quantum cell automata here. You need also uh, some kind of logical gates that would implement a uh, universal family of, of uh, Boolean gates. You need some kind of delay so that you could synchronize your signals, and you need some kind of uh, clock so that you don't have to do only monotonistic computation. But with all that, you can implement finite state machines, and with finite state machines, you have enough to make the control of a computational device and to do some kind of memory or unit of a memory, taking infinitely potential copies of the memory, you have uh, an infinite memory, and putting all these together, you have a universal computer. And indeed, that's what the construction do. And let me just sketch it in a completely ad hoc cellular automaton. Uh, okay, I did not design it for today. You s we said that this was an impromptu lecture, so I designed it a few years ago. But we are in dimension two. We have three states, fundamental neighborhood, and some local rules. So my three states are just white and black, empty and full. And there is a special activated state, which is this cross here. And the idea is that you can only uh, if you are empty, you can stay empty or move to the full state. When you are full, you can stay full or move to the activated state. And activated state, in the next step, will just be empty again. And how do you proceed to move from one state to the other? When you are in the empty state, you move to the full state if condition alpha is fulfilled. What is condition alpha? You have two neighbors which are opposite and are non-empty, either east-west or north-east or both. And for condition beta uh, to go from uh, full to activated, you need at least two neighbors which are non-empty. And uh, you need, among your non-empty neighbors, exactly one which is uh, in a state different from the others. So what can you do with that? Uh, if you take this, does this work? No. If you take uh, this part of a two-dimensional configuration in the bottom here, you have some kind of wire of full uh, states, which is going uh, horizontally. And you have one activated state and an empty state. It's the same idea as code construction. So if you apply the rule, you would see that this signal will move to the right and will continue to do so. Uh, when it will arrive at the boundary of your, your uh, configuration, it will actually disappear. And if you take two signals in front of each other, they will just destroy each other and keep your wire intact. So what can you do with that? Uh, first, let's look at what happens at intersections. So if you have intersection of wires, um, so the drawings in the top shows that uh, when a, a signal enters an intersection alone, it will duplicate to all the other branch of the intersection. When you have two signals that uh, arrive at an intersection, like in the second strip, or actually when signals arise from all the branches but one, then they will do the reverse of the first line. They will um, get you a signal on the last branch. And if at an intersection you are in neither of the previous case, if you have signals coming b from several branches but not all but one or not a, just a single one, then the signal will disappear. And then the claim is that this is more than enough to do universal computation. Also, uh, so let's do electronics. First, we will construct a diode. That's the, the little uh, gadget in the top. So why is it a diode? If you put a signal in the input wire, 
At the first intersection, it will go up and down and to the right. Then it will turn, turn again. The two signals will meet in a uh, synchronized way, and you will have a signal in the output. If you put a signal from the output wire, it will be almost the same, but when they arrive at the intersection with four branches, the signal will disappear, right? So it's a diode, and with a diode and uh, some more collision, you can do a OR gate, which is at the bottom. You can think about it, but if you send someone from A, from B, or from both, you would have an output at the end, yes? And uh, if you modify it a bit, you have a XOR gate. And maybe you know uh, that when you have XOR gates and you have planar circuits, you can do crossings. You do it like that. You just take three XOR gates and you combine it like that and it will provide you with uh, your input signals in reverse order because A X or B X or A is B, and uh, B X or A X or B is A. So we have signals. We have doors, some gates. We have a fan out. We have crossing. But maybe you would say you just have monotone circuits because you have just end and O. But then you use the other tricks from the book. The other trick from the book is if you just have monotone circuit, you take a pair of signals, and uh, you get all the gates you want. So this would be my end gate. Yeah, OK, it takes a bit of space, but we are doing theory, right? So uh, on the top is my A signal. So I, I see it as a pair of A and non, not A. On the bottom, you have B. And my claim is that uh, if they arrive in a synchronized way, then at the end, you would get A and B and uh, the complement. Yeah. Yes, exactly. So you obtain delay by uh, taking a longer route than uh, the other signal. Oh, and uh, on the web page, there is uh, the rule for Goli if you want to play with it. And the patterns are there also. So now we are done because we can do this, which is basically uh, all you need to do universal computation in circuits, you can encode any finite state machine as a circuit with your internal state entering the circuit on one side and the next state uh, um, being provided as an output. <coughs> you also can have wires that take the input values that you read from uh, the exterior of your <laughs> computing uh, core. And um, after one iteration of your finite state machine, you would get the output and the internal state. You can wire back to the entrance of the circuit. Actually, this is exactly the kind of machine which is described and gave rise to a Kleene's paper on a finite automaton. That's why we have finite state machines, because of uh, people doing circuits in, actually, in, in silicon, of course, not in. Uh, in silicium, sorry, not in uh, cellular automata. But. And um, then you are universal for Boolean circuits. And the claim is that more or less you have enough for universal computation. But of course, if you want a potentially infinite memory, then you need some ultimately periodic configuration because I don't have any way to construct stuff there. Is that clear? Yeah. Yes. So. So the, the blue, yeah. the blue thing is for copper or in general? It's in general if you don't have more than that. Should I repeat? It's, so, so the question was, is the, the blue uh, remark uh, just for copper, right? Or, or in general? So in general, if you just have circuit simulation in, in that, that way, if you don't talk about uh, generating stuff in the configuration, then in general, you need uh, ultimately periodic uh, stuff to, for universal computation. But uh, in some automata, like von Neumann construction, you can uh, construct a uh, new part of the machine during the computation. So you would imagine, for example, that if you would do that with a von Neumann machine, you could have a constructor that would uh, 
build new memory cell when you need more memory. Or if you imagine the Turing machine from uh, Sylvain's lecture, we always describe the Turing machine with the B-infinite tape, but in practice, usually you don't have uh, infinitely many paper sheets on your desk, but when you want more, you just add more to them. So that's the idea. Okay, but you want the game of life, I know. Uh, it's the same, actually. So uh, if you just want to do uni universal circuit with the game of life, it's just the same idea. You take gliders, so gliders are do this arrangement of cells. It moves in four steps, uh, one uh, cells in diagonal. It's rotation invariant, you see, the game of life. So you can do it in four directions. When you have two gliders that uh, arrive face to face with the right synchronization, then they just disappear, both of them. And so you have these uh, very nice constructions which are described in uh, <coughs> Winning ways. Um, I will provide you with a few, a few uh, widgets. So my first widget is that uh, little guy on the bottom right, that uh, L shape with a little hat. If you send the glider into it, it disappears. So it's uh, some kind of a heater for uh, gliders. The small two by two square can be seen as a gadget to do duplication. If you send two gliders next to it, one of them will disappear, the other one will continue. You have this uh, gun that I presented already, which is uh, constructing some kind of, of signal consisting of the gliders. You all know that uh, with good synchronization, if you have two roads which are crossing at 80 degrees, if people drive at 200 uh, miles per hour on it, with the right spacing, they cross without crash. That's the case also for gliders. And with all of that, you can do, yet again, your gates. So what's the idea? Um, if you have some gliders, uh, let me call X a signal, which is either nothing if there is no signal, or a flux of gliders if there is one. Then if you put a gun perpendicular to it, if x is 0, you will just provide the glider, so the, it's the complement. If x is 1, then the gliders will uh, collide and disappear, and you will get 0. So you can do the complement, the nut operation, and turn in the same uh, in one operation. Using that, you get the second uh, picture. That's how you cross information. If you have uh, x and y, you can get y and x using uh, the crossing uh, widget and uh, two collisions and two GANs. Then you can do also some uh, duplications. That's the third uh, diagram. You have the AND gate and the OR gate also. And using the same tricks as before, you get universal computation for the game of life. Of course, there are way more smarter ways to do nice things in the game of life, but uh, at least this gives you universality. OK, that's for dimension two. But then what do you do in dimension one? Because circuits, yes, sorry. Maybe because it was asked whether you need the uh, Yeah. So because you told everybody I'm the expert and someone asked about the whether you need an ultimately periodic initial configuration. So yeah, in yeah, Game yeah. of Life you do not need an, an uh, you, you can start with a literally finite configuration, but this is a million times harder than what's being done here. So Game of Life is, so I think you're gonna talk about intrinsic universality probably, but yeah. in any case Game of Life is in a very strong way able to, intrinsic universality means you can simulate every other cellular time. The Game of Life can simulate every other cellular time and so that that zero symbols are simulated by literally empty space. So this means that, for example, it can simulate von Neumann's constructor in such a way that the empty space is literally empty space in the simulation. But this is a super difficult construction which nobody can simulate nowadays with nowadays, com like yeah. today's computers. We can These things we can like definitely that. simulate, but this big construction we cannot. Okay, thanks. This is due to Adam Goucher. Yeah, there are a lot of very nice subtle stuff uh, that do exist, and uh, 
we won't really enter into these details, but uh, basically what you do in the game of life is that you, you have some kind of uh, machineries that you can move around to construct uh, anything you want. As a kind of intermediate thing to Adam really, uh, Yeah, exactly, yeah. But also, okay, also there is the question if, if uh, fundamental is really construct Tor universal, you need to be precise about that. But, yeah. Okay, let's move to dimension one. So if I want to, yeah, no, okay, we won't. It's universal to Boolean C. Ah, you need the microphone. Sorry. Oh, I need to refresh. Is universal for Boolean circuits the same as Turing universal? Ah, but I did not define Turing universal yet. So okay, well, then <laughs> after. Boolean circuits, not, not. Yeah. So there is no formal definition here. Yeah. It's a bit strange, right? Yeah. It's not very satisfactory to have You just have a that. Boolean universal feeling and... Yeah. yeah. It's a very good question. Um, I agree. I will try to answer. Let's wait for the definition. You see, the definition is right there, right? It's missing something, but... It's almost there. But how do you do in dimension one? The, the circuit thing won't work, right? Because if you need the unbounded number of wires going through cells with finitely many states, it seems like there is a problem. So you can do other things. You can simulate some kind of sequential model. Like, if I remember correctly, uh, Sylvain's talk, a Turing machine, you have your tape like that with symbols on the tape. And you have some kind of a head which is pointing somewhere, right? With a finite state. It's, it's almost a configuration of a stellar automaton. But then, of course, if I remove the head, nothing happens, right? But you, what you can do, you, you can just punch the head so that it enters the configuration. And then, if you do that, You have some kind of uh, paint, painting by a finite set of, of colors, right? That's the set of states union, the set of, of uh, symbols from the tape. And the rule is local, right? Because the nothing happens if you don't see the head. And if you see the head, you just change things locally. So you can simulate some sequential device like that. That's exactly what Smith 3 does in uh, 71, and then you have improvement on that, and then you have, uh, oh, we are video recorded. So you, we have Cook theorem from 2004, where uh, rule 110 is proved to be, uh, no, I don't know what is proved. Uh, we are given the, how do you say just before? It, it was very nice. Um, the idea of some kind of uh, universality, some Turing universality feeling. Yeah? OK. So we need a definition. And so a serial automaton is Turing universal if, if, uh, I don't know, it's complicated. And uh, no, actually, I, my understanding is that there is no consensus of, on what is Turing universal because it's complicated to give a definition that will capture all the construction on which we have this feeling, will behave in a way that seems reasonable with the construction where different people have different feelings, because they exist also, and uh, that would exclude all the contrived examples we can think of, which are clearly not universal, but play with the definition you give. So there is an attempt in a I know several attempts, but one attempt I, I like to talk about is a paper by Durand and Roca from 99. It describes actually the universality of the game of lives and try to give a definition of what it's trying to prove. I, I, know, I, I, I know four different versions of the papers with different definitions, and uh, none of them finally is, is convincing. So 
I, I believe it's complicated because you try to take some kind of sequential idea of computation. You have an input, then you compute, and at some point it stops mechanized computation in a very mechanical way, right? And then you need to decode your output. That's what you want to, to put inside an object, a serial automaton, which is really a dynamical system. So you have configuration and you have iteration on it. There is no notion of halting, no notion of, of finite uh, quantity of something. So it's difficult. So I'm sorry, I, I will not provide the definition for that, but then I, I have a trick, I have a definition of something else that I prefer to use. Yeah, but this definition is, is a definition in this paper. They try to define Turing universality yes. or s uh, Turing universality. Turing universality. And, uh, but they tried hard to do it. I mean, it's not a problem with the authors. I believe it's a problem with the notion of Turing universality. It's a, it's a, a feeling, but not a precise uh, uh, notion that you can really formalize. So just some Little details about the one-dimensional uh, things. So this is how Smith works, basically. Uh, times always move upward, but I said it already. Nobody would put time downwards. It doesn't make sense. I'm looking at other people doing cell automata in the room when I say that. Uh, no, actually, it's, I believe it's in Lyon that time goes up. In Australia, it will be clear why, but... <laughs> <laughs> but you, you know, on the web page for this research school, there is a, a small a footnote at the end of the FAQ saying why Marseille, I don't know something. You should read it. But um, uh, I think for time, it's, it's the Lyonese uh, <laughs> point of view. It actually is Mazoyer school of, of cellular automata, right? So uh, in Smith, it's really putting the head of the Turing machine in the cell on which it's pointing, and you just simulate, right? And we all agree that this has, a f this has the feeling of, of Turing universality. Uh, what Lingon and Nordal do is just a simple trick. They say, OK, right, a Turing machine, it changed the states and it moves. Let's decompose this into two steps. So you have moving steps and you have computing steps. And uh, the trick is that every cell knows locally which step you are doing because you just encode it in a very synchronized way. And then uh, you just go to two states uh, quite easily <laughs> with rule 110. Um, OK, this is not exactly a two states around the automaton, right? What I'm displaying. Actually, it's, it's, it looks more like that, the automaton, when you look at space time. And you have those big collisions of incoming particles that you combine, and you get that picture if you take one step back and paint all the things together. So it's a wonderful construction, which is implementing a very strong feeling of Turing universality inside the automaton. And um, if you want, I can describe it in details, but then you won't be able to go in the Kalong this afternoon. <laughs> and we want to go to the Kalong. So, but I will just give a little uh, idea of what is behind this. So, what Cook does, he does not simulate the Turing machine directly because it's difficult. He is given the rule, that's 110, and he needs to construct something inside that, that uh, automaton. What he does is that he simulates some universal uh, model, which he calls uh, cyclic tax systems, which is, I believe, something he, tr he introduced himself based on post tax systems, which is a well known. Uh, universal model of computation. So uh, the idea of post tax systems is the following. You have finite words on the binary alphabet. Those are your configurations somehow. And at each time in your computation, you also know either the time step modulo some value. That's one way to, to say it. Or you have a finite collection of words Say U1, U2, etc. And um, a transition works like that. If you, you look at the first letter of your world, you erase it. If it was a zero, all you do 
is in your list, you make a rotation by taking the first word and putting it at the end of the list. And you do a new step. If it was a one, then after erasing the one, you copy the word which is at the first, in the first position of your list at the end of the current word. And you iterate like that. And the claim is that you can simulate any Turing computation with that. And then the game of life with collisions and uh, particles implement this. How should you read this? Uh, so there are three parts in the drawing. On the left, you see all those signals, right? Those are just clock ticks that will give the rhythm. That's when we should have the piano, actually. So <laughs> those are the ticks for the computation to happen. Signals are moving from left to right. In the middle, you have something that encodes your current word as a succession of signals. So I believe that on my drawing, um, those are the blue ones, which are the thinner blue ones that go to the, to the left. And then on the right, you have that list repeated um, periodically and in a frozen state. Those are the big blue ones. And uh, the yellow signals that you see are the boundary between the worlds. And now the little dance that the automaton does is the following. When uh, a tick encounters a letter, it erases the letters, moves up traversing all the world until it sees the boundary signal. It starts to either unfreeze if it was a one or destroy if it was a zero the next world and uh, stop when it encounters the next boundary. And then you are universal, right? Because the model here is universal. It's very subtle, it works very well. It requires <laughs> an infinite quantity of energy coming from the left, the ticks. It requires an infinite uh, information on the right. But the information here is not encoding the computation. We are not cheating. And uh, the quantity of uh, information inside that part is bounded, if I take Sasha's point of view then. So somehow, it's uh, Turing universal enough. So the definition, if you have one for Turing University, should capture this in particular. If you want the details, the paper by uh, Cook is quite readable, I think. Yeah, I wrote theorem. That's a bit of a problem if there is no definition, right? Oh, yeah. In defense of Cook, while uh, there may not be a good definition of Turing Universal in his paper, there are pr like precise, undecidable yeah, yeah, sure. statements stated mm. in there. For example, he literally states the problem of whether a particular glider eventually appears or a particular pattern eventually appears starting from a universally, uh, ultimately periodic configuration. He states that this is undecidable. So he does state precise mathematical facts, unfortunately not in a theorem block. So if you're a mathematician, you will find this a little annoying, but what you're going to do? Yeah, yeah, uh, OK. I'm not stating that uh, the paper is uh, not well written, of course. And uh, yeah, but. Um, Still, um, having uh, undecidable uh, properties on the object is not the same as being able to, to compute in a complete ray, right? Also, I think. Even there are improvements on this, like uh, there is the Woods uh, Neary uh, uh, paper. OK, but maybe you find all of this not very satisfying because serial automata are massively parallel objects, right? There are updates everywhere. And we are compu computing in a boundary in the middle uh, in one cell. That's not very satisfying. So we would like to do something like this. We would like to have uh, some kind of uh, computations everywhere in our cellular space. 
but if you are universal for Boolean circuit, you can just wire a finite state machine that encodes a cell of a cellular automaton. You take infinitely many copies of them, you wire them together, and you have something a lot more satisfying, some kind of parallel intrinsic simulation of cellular automata by one cellular automaton. And what is nice is that this one I can define precisely. But maybe my definition will not be consensual. OK. This is the way I do it. Uh, and uh, I think it's a good way to have some kind of universality definition. I hope so. So the idea is to define some, some uh, quasi-orders on the set of cellular automata so that the equivalence class of the quasi-order, they do capture some idea that all the automata inside the class have somehow the same, behave the same, right? So one way to do it is to say that, OK, one automaton is simpler than another if I can find all the space-time diagrams of the first one inside the space-time diagrams of the other one. So to say that, I believe that the name of the state do not matter. So I authorize some way to map the states of A to the states of B. That would be my function phi there. And, uh, what does it mean that the space-time diagrams of one automaton are inside the other? It means that that diagram commutes. If you take a configuration, you apply the rule. Or if you apply my re-encoding of the, of the states in a uniform way and apply the rule of the, the other automaton, it's the same as uh, computing and encoding. Right? Of course, in, in these settings, the yes? Maybe just to, what, what do you mean of phi, of phi? It's a function that just gives the name of a state in A when you want to look at it as a state in B. But, so but it's a mapping it? from a finite set of state of A to the finite set of state of B. But do you demand any morphism structure from phi? No, it's really a, an injective function on the finite set to have another finite set. Oh, okay. So you don't change the scale, it's just one cell to one cell. Yeah, you're right. We should change the scale, right? Because if you want to have uh, blocks of cells, uh, maybe something like that, right? So that's the second step. If I have that diagram on the left and uh, I make, uh, I w want to encode something with it, I should be able to take blocks of cells and uh, call it uh, a cell of the new automaton. And also, I want to be able to remove some uh, time steps of the computation. And also, maybe if you want to shift it a little bit, that should be also something you want to do. Actually, those are exactly the only geometrical transformations that preserve the whole state of cellular automata. It comes with a proof, actually. Uh, and uh, so. That would be the transformation ID. You have M and K. M is the size of the blocks of cells that you do. N is the number of time steps that you consider. And uh, N is your shift. So the, the global rule of the automaton is just uh, given by that formula here. And you can see already in this example, if I have these space-time diagrams and I do 4 for 1 uh, bulking, you see something in red here. Maybe if you have very good eyes, you can see it on the left, but I believe most people don't see it. So take any line in the diagram on the left and uh, look at it from left to right. So it might be black, 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 white, black, 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 white, and at some point it changed to black, white, 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 black, white, 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 or the reverse. So there is a signal in the middle of this configuration, but it's easier to see it when you rescale, right? And then you have this rescaling, you have this notion of, of uh, this quasi-order from before, and you get the bulking quasi-order. A is uh, simpler than B. If up to rescaling, all the space diagrams of B are space diagrams of, of A, sorry, are space diagrams of B. 
And uh, OK, we can say a, a lot of nice things about this. Some years ago with uh, Guillaume, which is, is right there, and uh, Jacques Mazoyer and Marianne Delorme, we wrote uh, a paper about that. Um, this is what the quasi order looks like. So at the bottom, you have the equivalence class of the very nice Sailor automaton with one state. It's a bit boring, but uh, he has nice space time diagrams. And it turns out there is a maximal class for this quasi order. And that would be my candidate for universality, right? But you have a lot of nice things also appearing uh, inside that quasi order, like being ultimately periodic defines an ideal of the quasi order, being reversible also, being subjective. And you have some class that identifies some particular behavior, like being nilpotent. Nilpotent C are uh, so automata for which every space time diagram, after some times, are just uniformly monochromatic. And then I have a definition of universal. For those who want defi a definition, you are intrinsically universal if you can simulate every other solar automaton. Right? Uh, there are some Turing universal feelings automaton which are not intrinsically universal. That exists. Uh, then how can I state that this is a theorem if I don't have a definition of a Turing universal? So you provide the Turing universal uh, object, and I believe that my construction can be adapted. And when you can do a Boolean circuit, which is also not defined, this can enter this uh, particular uh, uh, construction stuff. OK, so but how do you go to dimension one then from there? So there is a trick due to banks to do that. The idea is that if you have a two-dimensional solar automaton doing circuits, if you consider a bounded circuit in a strip, you can construct a one-dimensional CA. From it, you just uh, take your, your strip of cells, you take your segments, and you put them horizontally. And you change your neighborhood so that it maps correctly to uh, what were your neighbors in two dimensions. So there are other ways to do universality in one dimension. One way is with Turing machines. So you take your Turing machine from Sylvain's course lecture, and uh, instead of uh, having one Turing machine, one head alone in a big tape with no one to talk to, you take infinitely many heads. And those heads in parallel will compute. Each one will be in charge of a finite part of the tape. And then they will have to move to the neighbors to copy the state, et cetera, et cetera. So that's one way to do it. And you can do more tricky stuff, like uh, emulate circuits uh, in napkins, oh no, sorry, with uh, some uh, well-designed circuits. OK. But that's still not completely satisfying, right? Because maybe we can do stuff with parallel machines that we cannot do with sequential machines. <coughs> so. In the 70s, people have used also cellular automata to recognize languages, to do some formal language uh, theory. And there is a, a nice notion of, of language recognition. So your input is a finite word. And uh, you put some special state in the border so that the computation do not evade. And after some computational time, you want to decide if the word is in the formal language you are trying to recognize. And for that, you look at the first cell at the precise time step. Right? So of course, if you want to be able to take into account all the letters of the word, you should at least wait for the information which is on the far right to come to the first cell. So the best you can expect to recognize a language is uh, real time, exactly n time steps to, to decide. And if you want a, a little more flexibility to compute, maybe linear time is good. Some constant times n. 
So what can you do in real time? Actually, quite a lot of things. For example, you can recognize palindromes in a very uh, intuitive way. So imagine you're given a finite words of A and Bs, and you want to decide if it's palindromic. So if it's the same word when you read from right to left and left to right. If you would test it in a, with a sequential machine, what you would do is certainly you would go from left to right and compare to the letter at the other extremity of the world at each time step. It would take something like a linear time, but on a Turing machine, you would take quadratic time because you would have to move uh, around. So for cellular automata, uh, the idea to do this in, in uh, real time is the following. In the beginning, every cell decides to be the center of the world. So you decide that you are certainly in the center of the world, and what you need to do is compare the letters which are on your left with the letters which are on your right. To do so, we will uh, have the letters moving around space. So we will send every letter in the, to the right, and we will send every letter to the left. So each of my cell will need to remind exactly three things. <coughs> the letter coming from the left and going to the right, the letter coming from the right and going to the left, and whether or not, if I am the center of the world, what I have seen until now is palindromic. So on my picture, the pairs of symbols are the left and the right letter, and uh, red means that I have seen two different letters from left and right at some point in time, and I, if I am the center, it's not a palindrome. And green says, up until now, everything is fine. I always have seen the same letters coming from left and right. So in the first time step, what you do is that uh, you send your letter to the neighbors, receive the letters from your first neighbor, and decide if you are red or green. Then the computation uh, starts to behave, and you need to detect where is the real center of your segment. So in the beginning, you see that the two cells uh, on the boundaries, they have these special symbols right next to them. So you will send a, a signal from the left, left side and a signal from the right side, and when the signal collides, it's the middle of the world. And all you have to do when you are the middle cell is that when both signals arrive, you send your color as the result of the computation to the first cell in the segment. So it's for palindromes of odd length, yeah? My pictures are for palindromes of odd lengths, but you can easily do it also for even length palindromes. But then you need to be careful because we want to recognize in, in, in uh, time n and not n plus one. So it should be, if you are even, it should be the left cell that sends the signal at the, the right one, right? But it can be done. OK, so people uh, had a lot of nice construction about that. And there is a, a, a nice open problem that maybe you can solve before the end of the week. Uh, so, so first, like for Turing machine, we have some kind of acceleration theorem. You, yes, there is a trade-off. If you want your, your uh, language recognition to be faster, you can do it with more states. So that's the theorem on the top. If you can recognize a language in n plus t of n, then you can do it in n plus t of n over k for all positive k. The cost is that your set of states increase exponentially. Then, of course, if you have a linear time recognition, when k increases, you tend to n, and you want to know if you can reach the limit, right? So that's the open problem. Does real time equal linear time? We don't know. Uh, what we know is a very nice characterization by Ibarra that uh, linear time <coughs> equals real time if and only if the set of real time recognizable uh, languages is closed by mirror image. For linear time, it's easy to return the word in uh, linear time. In real time, it's not. And, um, 
Yeah, that's one open problem on cellular automata, which is uh, open for quite some time, so it should be solved, right? And is there some specific example of uh, uh, a language which is not known that it's mirror I images real time, but it's in real time? So. Yeah, I think there are several candidates like that, yes. Then uh, I, I don't have the example uh, in my head. Uh, you should look for um, Véronique Terrier writing uh, on the subject because she is the expert on that. Mm. Or we can ask her uh, in two weeks, actually. Is, is it the case that linear time is the upper bound? Uh, so, so there are languages that you cannot recognize in ah, linear okay. time, That right? was my question. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Um, um, the, the most out outrageous way to see it is that there are non-recursive languages. Mm -hmm. um, okay. So, so, still in the massively parallel task, uh, the other example that we always uh, look at is the firing squad problem. So, it's a very nice problem, a bit, uh, the, maybe the name is not uh, very nice, right? Firing squad, but, uh, so what is the idea? You are given, uh, like for parallel recognition, you have a finite segment of cells you have some special state on both sides. The first cell in the beginning has been promoted as a general, and all the other ones are quiescent soldiers. So if they don't receive any others, they keep in the same state. What we want to do is uh, for all the cells to fire at the same time. It's forbidden to fire before everybody is firing, and so the red state should appear in the segment for everyone precisely at the same time. <coughs> and you have to devise some kind of algorithm to do that. So there is a, a very nice construction by Minsky, which is pictured on the right. Uh, and odd even are solved uh, using the, the, the same ID. Uh, but it's easier to draw it like that. So how could you solve that task? Uh, if you want everybody to be able to do it at the same time, the first idea would be to split recursively your segment. So you need to find the middle. How do you find the middle? You just send two signals. One in real time will bounce on the, on the right, and uh, a quick calculation will uh, give you the slope that you want for another signal starting from the general that will, when it intersects the first signal, find the middle of the configuration. And then recursively you restart. And then maybe you think, uh, okay, we have solved the problems, but in fact, all the details in the constructions is how in this discrete object, it's very discrete, how do you do the last synchronization? How do you detect that you are at the end? So you need to be very careful to what happens when uh, you have uh, uh, very uh, near signals in the end, but if you do it carefully, you can make everyone detect that we are arrived in a state where everybody knows that we are ready, and then you can make them fire. If you do that, you will see that you need three n minus one time steps. You can do it with a few states. 15 states, pl the plus one is the black state in the border that you don't use inside your space. Um, but first question you might have is, is 3n minus 1 optimal? So what is clear is that you cannot do way faster than about 2n, right? Because you need the signal to go to the end and to come back. Um, and actually, the optimal time is 2n minus 2. And uh, we have construction for that. And there is this uh, very subtle construction by Jacques Mazoyer from uh, 84, which with six states plus one achieved the optimal time. To date, it's still the 
the best solution. I believe there is a proof that you cannot do four. And uh, if you find five by the end of the week, please contact us. <laughs> <laughs> so, so basically what you have is some uh, collection of signals of increasing slopes uh, in order to, to fasten the, what was the middle trick before is now a third trick. You see, every third you get a vertical signal and it's still recursive. And um, to get very few states, there is some very subtle encodings inside those strips that you see here. If you try to construct this automaton, you will see, for example, that uh, there are transitions that you don't need uh, until you use uh, segments of size uh, 122, something like that. So really, the, the transitions are all there for something. And it makes nice picture for cakes also. No questions until there? Yeah. Philip. So what the heck is this doing? <laughs> what, sorry? So wh wh what is it doing? Do you know? What is it doing? Um, oh, well. No, I think it's, OK. I should say two things. It's like for the middle before, right? So the, the main idea is simple. The details of why, in the end, you have just enough transitions so that it can work, it's a bit uh, I tricky. Yes, by by exactly. So that's the easy part. How do you do all the thirds? It's also quite easy to see how your strips go to larger strips so that you have this uh, increasing uh, third. But the, the question is more about the little uh, pink dots, for example, that you see there. Yeah, you see on, on the right, you have those pink dots with uh, strange patterns. And also, at the very end of the computation, there are some subtleties for the last synchronization. So, yes, that's the way I don't understand. Otherwise, the two-thirds, it's, it's OK. Um, is the problem feasible if you put the general at some random point, at some random position? Yeah, yeah. So people have studied a lot of variations, like having two generals, having one moving general, having, uh, uh, I think, Jean-Baptiste Younes should be the, the specialist of that. I think there is a generic one where you don't know where the general is. It just knows that it's finite and, uh, yeah. Okay, so I believe this is the end of part one and we still have something like 10 minutes, right? Yeah. So I will be tempted to <coughs> maybe give some definition and stop somewhere there. Yeah. Because 45 out of 105, oh, you know. It's not the middle. <laughs> okay. So, so this was part one was about nice construction, but I know some preferred theorem. So, okay. Uh, this is part two. Uh, so, what would be in part two? I, I should say some word about the dynamical system point of view with a warning. I'm a computer scientist. I'm not a mathematician. I know a bit of stuff about that, but maybe the way I define the objects are not very canonical. So this is the warning. And once this is done, we will look at uh, immediate and dynamical properties of, of the object. So I have a definition of a solar automaton if you don't have it in your head. It's a bit different from the previous one. So if you look, before I had a neighborhood, now I have a radius. It's the same. Uh, the idea now is that I look at all the cells at distance uh, up to air around uh, my, my cell. So you can put any finite neighborhood inside the radius. Otherwise, it's the same. Configuration, space-time diagrams. I believe I will put these slides back next time. So, but people doing discrete dynamical systems, they don't define objects like that, right? In a syntactic way. They have some very nice topological space, and then there is a map acting on this space. It's, and then uh, the map is continuous because it's better. And you have orbits, which are sequences of, of uh, iteration of the map on your initial uh, state. And you can do very nice diagrams where you see everything uh, converging to some attractors. We can do that for solar automata too. So if you take your 
a set of configuration. There is a, a natural way to put a, a metric on it, and you can put the counter topology on this set. And uh, if you do so, it turns out that uh, cellular automata have continuous map, which are invariant by translation because we define the rule locally. So if I translate my configuration, the image is translated. OK, so a topological space, if I understand correctly, you have your space and you have a set of open sets, right? So you should have the empty and the full uh, set inside this. It should be closed by union and finite intersection. One way to do it on a, on a finite set is to take the discrete topology. You take just all possible sets and declare them open. And the counter topology is just the product topology of this. So on the S to the ZD, you just take the product of uh, the discrete topology on S. And what is nice is that it's metric and it's compact. So compact here, it would simply mean that uh, if you take any sequence of configuration, you can, by extraction, construct <coughs> a, a configuration uh, in the limit. And uh, metric means that you don't really need topology. In fact, you can talk about the distance. So um, one particular set of configuration we need are cylinders. So cellular automata are invariant by translation, but the counter topology, as it is the product topology, it uh, makes the, the position zero in the configuration have a very particular role. So the set of configurations which are identical around zero are my cylinders, and uh, it's a Kloppen uh, generating set for the topology. So what is the cylinder uh, defined by a finite pattern M? It's all the configurations that have M in the middle. And I will have some notation, so I have sub-cylinders if my patterns are included into one another, I will uh, talk about sub-cylinders. And then the distance for the contour topology is defined like so. If you have two configurations, you put them side by side, centers on zero. You look at all the positions where the configuration differ. You take the difference point, which is the nearest from zero. You look at the distance, and you take one over two to the, the distance. So for in this uh, particular example, the first error is at distance three. So the distance between the configuration is one over eight. And it turns out that the open balls of uh, that distance are exactly my cylinders. And I'm happy with that. OK. so. I believe we will stop here for today. That's a nice point to stop. And uh, we will start over with uh, those definitions next time and see how that uh, dynamical system point of view will collide with the more automatic point of view to give, for example, uh, undecidability result on uh, dynamical properties of the dynamical systems. <coughs> Thank you for your attention. So any, any questions for now? No, just I want to say me, me, the, defini pro, the definition of universality, of Turing universality. Don't you want to say that just uh, this, this diagram generated by a line is somehow uh, uh, P-space complete with respect to some log O of log time reductions? Is it, is it, is, is it not what, what, what the feeling is? No, uh, so, so. So somehow if you okay. have this, this picture and you can yeah. test some cell which you want uh, given by the coordinates, mm -hmm. uh, you can f predict what Turing machine does in, in polynomial time. OK, so, so there is a, a, another problem of that kind that you could consider. If, if you just take triangles of computation with a cellular automaton, there is a very nice decision problem. You are given that finite segment of cells. Yeah. You are given a candidates for the top value. And you need to test 
if uh, this is indeed what happened at the top of your cake. The cherry here is the uh, yeah. value. In general, this is P complete for cellular automata. For the same reason that it's P space to check the, the space time diagrams. F right? For a general cellular automata. Yeah, so if you, the cellular automaton is given as an input, then yeah. this is P space. Uh, this is P complete. Mm -hmm. And um, indeed, there are a lot of, of cellular automaton for which it is P complete. For example, Wood 110 is P complete for that decision problem, the prediction problem. But do I want to take this as a definition? I'm not sure because. In, in Turing Universal, there is really the, the feeling that you come with you the computation you want to do, you come with your input, and you can put it there, and uh, you would get your answer. So the encoding you have to do should be uh, reasonable. Okay, just about feeling. Yeah. Imagine that, that, that you can automaton cap can perform the Turing computation of Turing machine mm -hmm. in a very very good feel f felt way, but then it becomes slow and slower and slower, and finally to simulate n steps, you need that two to the two to the n uh, time. Is it is it still universal in your feeling or not? Or your feeling is not so precise to say it uh, exactly. Ah, okay. So it depends if you really care about having the result in the end or not, right? So, uh, no, I believe in m my old feeling is that we don't care about computation time. Mm -hmm. But for rule 110, the simulation by Cook at first was slow, exponentially slow oh. only. And uh, now we have a better uh, understanding. Uh, it's also a paper from uh, Neary and Wood that proves that. Uh, it's P it complete for that, complete, yeah. yeah. So, but I don't know what we want. It's, you know, Turing universality is a bit like uh, come as you like. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so. Okay, any, any, any other questions? You will have still a talk in two days, so but if you have questions now. Mm, I think it's okay. Okay, so let, let's thank you again. Thank you.